Well, you know, this week's uh, Torah portion is, is uh, certainly very interesting uh, because we learn a number of different things about the Lord and, and his interaction with, with, the, uh, with the people. I, uh, among other things, of course, uh, his power over, over the seas. Uh, that's really uh, very dramatic, over sea, over water, right? So the parting of the Red Sea, the parting of the water, and then, of course, that, that's why we have our Abrit Harasha portion for this week, our New Covenant portion, where we see Yeshua's power over the sea. That is uh, very, very, uh, very important. Uh, you know, in understanding this, the, uh, the the power of God, and really, you know, the fact that He is the sovereign over over creation and so on. But we also learn something else, uh, and that is the the um, the fact that God uh, cares so deeply for the people that He takes into consideration uh their uh you, you know their their state of being and what he does and, and there's a flexibility to the plan of god so when uh, god brought the people out of egypt uh, we see that uh we learn from even today's torah reading that he didn't take them by the most direct route because of the amalekites <laughs> and so uh, they they went on a circuitous route uh, and God took into uh, consideration their situation, you know, and uh, and and who they were. Uh, and so, some, you know, it's a great lesson. I think this was in the Dirage this week. It's a great lesson in that. And that lesson is that uh, uh, sometimes God takes us on a circuitous route, <laughs> you know, and we may not understand why we're exactly on the road we're on, but he knows better than us that if we took a different road, that might have looked more direct or might have looked better. It, it could have ended up disastrously. Uh, and so just uh, it's a, a great devotional lesson, I think, that, that we learned there. And that flexibility has something to do with what we want to talk about today. Uh, I know that we still have we still have some unfinished business in the book of Acts, uh, the 28th chapter. But um, I could not do that justice uh, this week. Uh, and so uh, I thought I would share on a uh, one of my favorite passages of Scripture uh, and something that I shared uh, actually a little bit uh, uh, last week when I was speaking to uh, uh, Devar Emmett and the folks there and uh, to the uh, uh, leaders that I was, uh, you know, that I was interacting with. And it's a great story that's in the Torah. And we do come to it every year because it's in the Torah it's in Bamidbar, in the book of Numbers, toward the end of the book of Numbers. Uh, it, it's a narrative that has some great lessons to us. It's found in Numbers chapter 32. Numbers 32. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful passage of scripture that uh, has some wonderful lessons uh, for, for us. So in Numbers 32, it's almost at the end of the uh, 40 years. Uh, and uh, we all know that uh, the reason that it took so long for uh, our ancestors to get to uh, uh, Canaan, Canaan, uh, was not because it was a 40-year journey. Uh, they, were go they were traveling in circles for much of it uh, because they were not trusting they were not trusting God, right? And uh, they would not enter the land. Ten, you know, ten of the tribes refused to enter the land. God judged the entire generation, and uh, it took all that time for that first generation to die in the wilderness. So now we have the second generation, and they're almost there. Uh, and uh, you know, you can just imagine Moses maybe feeling pretty good. Maybe we're over the hump. You, you know, but uh, but that was not yet to be. There were still some challenges for him to face. So you read here in uh, Numbers chapter 32, uh, it says, Now the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad had an exceedingly large number of livestock. And evidently half of the tribe of Manasseh uh, must have as well. Uh, because even though it doesn't mention them here at the beginning, we know that uh, what's going to happen here is going to include 
uh, two and a half tribes, the tribe of Ruvain, the tribe of Gad, and half of the tribe of Menashe. Okay. Now, so it says uh, uh, that they had a very large livestock. They had a lot of cows, right? They needed grazing land, see? So it says here, when they saw the land of Yazer and the land of Gilead, that it was indeed a place suitable for livestock, that the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben came and spoke to Moses and to Eliezer the priests and the leaders of the congregation. And so they're going to have a request. So you have to understand geographically where they are. So basically, they're at the plains of Moab. They're right, they're in that staging area, you know, where they were going to cross the, uh, the Jordan. And they see to the north, Beautiful, lush grazing land, okay? That today is the area around the Golan Heights. That's around where that is, okay? So they see it, and they're thinking to themselves, you know what, why do we need to cross the Jordan? Let's not cross the Jordan, and let's see if we can stay on this side of the Jordan, uh, you know, uh, for uh, because it's the best land for us. So here they approach Moses, and Moses, let's just say, uh, uh, did not receive this request very well. This really upset him, because to Moses, it sounded like what happened 38 years earlier. That, again, not everybody wants to cross the Jordan. Not everybody wants to go into the land. And they spend 40 years in the wilderness. Oh, no, when are we going to learn our lesson? So... This is, um, uh, you know, what they say in verse 5. If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession, and do not take us across the Jordan. Now, remember, the plan was that all the tribes had an inheritance on the other side of the Jordan, but they did not want uh, that. They uh, wanted the inheritance um, at, uh, you know, on the east side of the Jordan. So Moses says, in verse 6, shall your brothers go to war while you yourselves sit here? Now, why are you discouraging the sons of Israel from crossing over into the land which the Lord had given them? So this was very discouraging that uh, here you had uh, uh, two and a half tribes that had their own preferences. Uh, they, they wanted what was best for them, but it seemed that it was discouraging uh, for everybody else, because they were not going to be unified uh, in, uh, you know, in crossing. And so it brought them discouragement. Now, Moses is now going to rehash the whole, the whole story of uh, the, um, you know, uh, them spying out the land. And most of the tribes don't want to, uh, across, don't want to cr cross into the land. God is angered, and, and we don't want that to happen again. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and so that's Moses' response. Basically, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, uh, we're, this is not going to happen again. So now these tribes, this is really very interesting. Evidently, they think about this. And they come up with a, um, they come up with a proposal. They come up with a, with a, with a plan or a proposal to see if they might be able to still uh, do this. So now in verse um, 16 of Numbers 32, it says, Then they came near to him and said, We will build here sheepfolds for our livestock and cities for our little ones. But we ourselves will be armed, ready to go, before the sons of Israel until we have brought them to their place while our little ones live in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until every one of the sons of Israel has possessed his inheritance. For we will not have an inheritance with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond, because our inheritance has fallen to us on this side of the Jordan toward the east." So they, they uh, come up with a, uh, it's, this is like a negotiation. They come up with a proposal. The proposal is, is that they will build uh, cities 
basically walls, they would build walls uh, for their families and for the livestock. But then they would leave and they would go and fight along with their brothers until the land is settled. Now, this is really very interesting because we could say, well, yeah, but they're leaving their families, uh, you know, like in a safe place. Well, not really, because all the men were leaving, all the fighting men were leaving to go and fight with their brothers. So this, you know, this was a dangerous thing for them to do, okay? But the point is, is here that they, they say, we, you know, we will fight with our brothers. Uh, and, uh, you know, and how important is it? So, so they recognized uh, that they were part of uh, something uh, bigger bigger than themselves, okay? Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it's kind of interesting uh, that not just bigger than themselves in their own day, like, you know, it's not just about them, but it's also about their, their uh, brothers and their families, the whole people of Israel uh, being a, a unified. But it's also uh, uh, about Israel uh, before them and after them. In other words, uh, when I say they were part of something bigger than themselves, it wasn't only that they were part of Israel in the time in which they lived, but they were part of the eternal calling uh, of Israel. The promise of land came long before them, and the journey toward the land came long before them. They happened to be the generation to enter the land, and then there would be generations after them, after they would, would, would die, they, they certainly were not going to control the entire land in their lifetime. But they had a role to play in the time in which they lived. So they were part of something bigger than themselves in their own day, in their own calling with Israel in their own day. But they were, all, but they were also part of the calling of Israel in perpetuity. So this was a lot bigger than about grazing land. Uh, you know, and and their uh, and their own preferences, uh, and and so that's very important. As we'll see, we're also part of something much bigger than ourselves, and not only a meaning uh, we're part of the greater messianic Jewish movement, that kind of thing, or part of the greater body of Messiah around the world, but we're also part of what began two thousand years ago, and will continue until the day of Messiah. <laughs> you know. But God has given us a period of time in our lives uh, to uh, fulfill his calling in our lives for the, the time in which we're here, right? And, uh, and so that's uh, very, very important. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But there's something else uh, here that's going on. They were also uh, validated in their preferences. I think it's kind of interesting that Moses still that Moses allows for this to take place because this is not the original plan. This is not uh, how it was uh, evidently devised at the beginning. They were supposed to cross over with their brethren and, and take a, an, an inheritance on the other side. But Moses heard them. He listened to their needs and desires and all of that. They did not have bad hearts. They were not being uh, um, disobedient, as, as it were, but they shared with Moses this need of theirs, and Moses heard them. It sounds kind of like a story a little bit farther toward the very end of the book of Numbers, having to do with the daughters of Zelophehad, but we, we can talk about that at another time. But what it does do, it shows us <clears throat> that Moses, and dare I say the Lord himself, you know, uh, was flexible. How's that? Was flexible uh, a little bit here. Uh, that he allowed them to have this land on the other side of the Jordan. That really is astounding when you, when you think about it. Moses was sensitive to their concerns and allowed them to have the land, right? And, and uh, uh, But at the same time, they recognized their responsibility to the whole and to the uh, uh, plan of God. It was, it's a great example of a, a, a word that we often think is a very negative word. But uh, may I suggest it's an example of what we might call healthy compromise. You know, compromising is not always uh, 
uh, well, of course, in our world, it is always, uh, you know, you're right and I'm wrong or I'm wrong and you're right. And if I compromise, I'm going against everything I believe in and so on. But here was a meeting of the minds where these two and a half tribes had the chutzpah, right, to ask Moses if they could stay on this side of, of the Jordan. And Moses, while he while he told them, you know, you're, you're causing a discouragement and, and this is bad, he listened to them. And then they come back with a proposal, which he listens to. He doesn't just dismiss it. He listens to them. And um, both sides are able, you know, to uh, have their have their needs uh, uh, met, right? A pragmatic solution to meet the needs of of people. But this is not the whole story. There's, you know, as Paul Harvey used to say, and then there's the rest of the story. So in Numbers, what we have there is this is the plan. When we come to the book of Joshua, this is where it happens. Uh, the narrative story of actually going into the land and, and what happened. So if you turn to Joshua chapter 22, Joshua 22, we have this story of what these two and a half tribes actually do. And the part that we're interested in here is what happens when they're done. So they do just what they said they would do. Uh, they leave their families, they build uh, sheep folds and cities for their families. They go and they fight on the other side, right? That's what's happening in most of the book of Joshua. In chapter 22 uh, of Joshua, it's almost at the end of the book of Joshua, they're done. Now they come back and they do something very interesting. Okay, so I uh, we read here, uh, beginning in verse uh, 6, it says... Uh, so Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Now to the one half tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan, but to the other half, uh, Joshua gave a possession among his brothers westward. So when Joshua sent them away, they went to their tents and he blessed them. And he said to them, Reuben, to your tents with your great riches uh, and with very much livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, iron, uh, and uh, with a very uh, many clothes, divide the spoils of your enemies with your brothers. And the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and half-tribe of Manasseh returned home and departed from the sons of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the land of Gilead, to the land of their possession, which they had possessed, according to the command of the Lord through Moses. Okay. And when they came to the region of the Jordan, this is the important part here. And when they came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a large altar in appearance. It was so big that all the other tribes could see it. This was, this was a large structure. Okay? Now the sons of Israel, now their brothers heard, heard about it okay? and said, Behold, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan on the side belonging to the sons of Israel. And so now they're very angry. They're very angry. So they're going to send a delegation now to these two and a half tribes because they're about ready to make war with them. They just went with them to settle the land. They built this altar and now the brothers are all very angry. Why are they angry? They're angry because they've made an assumption about what these two and a half tribes have done now. They built an altar. The, uh, the ten tribes hear about it. They send a delegation and prepare for war because they think that it is a challenge to the tabernacle. They think that these two and a half tribes are now becoming idolatrous and are going to uh, have like another sanctuary, you know, kind of like later on in history, right? When uh, Jeroboam uh, in Samaria, you know, uh, uh, basically uh, built, built an altar there to rival Jerusalem. That's what many, many now years earlier, this is many years earlier, of course, this is what the tribes think the two and a half tribes uh, are, uh, are doing. And so we read that the passage goes on, uh, and uh, 
uh, and they uh, they, they accuse uh, they accuse their brethren. I, uh, so we read uh, here in verse 16. What is this unfaithful act which you have committed against the God of Israel, turning away from following the Lord this day by building yourselves an altar to rebel against uh, against uh, the Lord? You know, uh, how could you do uh, such a thing? Basically, the passage uh, will uh, will continue. Uh, now, when you go down, though, to verse 26 and following, here we have their response. Now, uh, their response. Uh, it's interesting. When you read uh, all the way through, verse, all the way to verse 25, this is called an act of treason. How could they do such a thing? But then they say that this is not what we did. You know, uh, this is not what we did. Actually, um, if I, if we go back to verse 22, 22, this is how they respond. The mighty one, God, the Lord, the mighty one, God, the Lord, he knows. And many Israel and may Israel itself know if it was in rebellion or in, in a, or if an act of unfaithfulness against the Lord do not save us this day. If we have built us an altar to turn away. From following the Lord, or if to offer a burnt offering or grain offering on it, or if to offer sacrifices of peace offerings on it, may the Lord himself require it of us. But truly we have done this out of concern for a reason, saying, in time to come, your sons may say to our sons, what have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? They were concerned with future generations, interestingly enough. For the Lord has made the Jordan a border between us, and you, your, and you, your, you sons of Reuben and Gad, you have no portion in the Lord. So your sons may make our sons stop fearing the Lord. In other words, they're saying in years to come, because of the the Jordan being a barrier between us, we don't want your ancestors, your, your descendants, to say that our descendants have no place with Israel. We don't want that to happen. Therefore, we said, let us build an altar, not for burnt offerings or for sacrifice. Rather, it shall be a witness between us and you, uh, between us and you, and between our generations after us, that we are to perform the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings that your sons may not say to our sons in time to come, you have no portion in the Lord. Therefore, we said it shall also come about if they say this to us or to our generations in time to come, then we shall say, see the copy of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings or for sacrifice. Rather, it is a witness between us and you. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn away from following the Lord this day by building an altar for burnt offering, for grain offering, or for sacrifice beside the altar of the Lord our God, which is before his tabernacle. So, why do I bring this up? So here, after uh, it's all said and done, there's another great lesson that we learn here. And we see that there was a misunderstanding between the uh, ten sons, you know, the ten tribes, ten and a half tribes, and the other two and a half tribes. A misunderstanding. They saw this altar. They heard about it. And you know what happens when you hear about things, right? You form opinions and judgments. And now they're ready to go to war against their brothers. So they come, and then the brothers explain. They communicate. They explain what they've done, and then everybody understands that they, that you know, uh, that they have not been rebellious. So we see here in both Numbers 32 and in uh, uh, Joshua chapter 22, we see how they maintained the unity. God created them as a unity, and they maintained the unity uh, by listening to one another. Uh, by recognizing that they were part of something greater than themselves, that it wasn't just about them, 
I, they, um, uh, they certainly um, yielded to the authority of Moses. They didn't just do what they, they wanted to do. They, they needed Moses' blessing, right? So they went about it the right way. Uh, their preferences were validated, uh, and so they fought together. They were unified. They fought together. Uh, the two and a half tribes were able to then have the land they needed, and then they were able to protect their unity uh, but you know, in their uh, communication, right? And of course, uh, interesting also that the ten and a half tribes are concerned about a about idolatry. Not just uh, they're not it, you know they're not just concerned about themselves, but they're concerned about idolatry. Uh, and uh, so they were concerned for you know godliness. And uh, the two and a half tribes explain themselves. Right. Uh, and so clearly there are some great lessons here for us. Right. Great lessons here for us. We also are, of course, part of something uh, bigger than ourselves. It's not just about Beth Messiah. Right. Not just that. I, I should say it like this. It, we're part of something bigger than ourselves, meaning it's not just about me. <laughs> right. It's just not just about me and my opinions. And it's not just about my family, uh, and it's not just about our community or our congregation or our city. Uh, it's it's not just uh, even about uh, uh, our part of the larger Messianic Jewish movement. It's not just part of our larger, uh, you know, involvement with the worldwide community of Messiah followers. But God has given us a period of time in which to serve him. Uh, and uh, we're part of who came before us and should, as we like to say, should the Lord tarry, uh, we are part of what will come after us, right? Now, in terms of the Messianic uh, Jewish world before us, you might wonder what was before us, <laughs> right? You know, Jewish people uh, and, uh, uh, well, I'll just say it like this. Jewish people were coming to know the Lord before there were Messianic congregations, before the, the uh, late 1960s and 70s and following. There, there were Jewish believers. You know, here in Columbus, uh, I know that you don't know this name, right? Now, if anybody knows this name, I want to hear from you if you know this name. Have, has anyone ever heard of Sanford Mills? Anybody ever hear that name? Sanford Mills. Okay. Sanford Mills uh, was from Springfield, Ohio but lived uh, in Columbus, and he worked for an outreach organization, which was the predecessor of Chosen People Ministries. And he lived here in Columbus, and he used to have meetings at the great, is it the Great Southern Hotel downtown? You know where I mean, right? He used to have meetings there in the 1950s and 1960s uh, and uh, into the 1970s, and then uh, he passed away. And a few years later, some guy named Howard got sent by the same organization to come to Columbus. Uh, I, I, you might know who he is, right? But anyway, uh, you know, the, there was a movement before us. Uh, we weren't called Messianic Jews. We we're called Hebrew Christians, right? We don't use that terminology anymore, but that's okay. Uh, you know, but that's, that laid the foundation for the Messianic Jewish movement. And who knows what God is going to do after us? You know, who knows? But we have a responsibility today, while we can still call it today, as we read in Psalm 95 in the book of Hebrews, chapters 3 and 4, while it is still called today, uh, you know, let us be diligent to fulfill the calling that God has given us in our day. And here, that is Beth Messiah. We are a link in a big chain uh, having to do with, yes, uh, our larger messianic movement, larger body of Messiah today, but also what he will do in the future. And so let us be encouraged to know that as long as we are faithful doing what we're called to do, right, when we're all done, God is the one who gives the increase. God is the one who will, you know, who will do what he will do. Our calling is to be faithful in our lives. Uh, and uh, and so may we have that kind of broad world view that uh, you know God has called us for this season of his of his story or of 
history. So just be faithful. Uh, and, uh, and just like we read in the book of Hebrews, like in the 11th chapter, you know, Abraham died not seeing the fulfillment of the promise, but he knew that the promise was going to come. Well, we may not, you know, at the end of our day, we may not see another great revival. We may, we may not, who knows, but we're called to just remain faithful, to share the good news of Messiah, to take the initiative, to grow in our walk with God, to demonstrate the Jewish Yeshua in this world. Uh, and to be proactive, uh, you know, in our walk with God in this world. God will bring the fruit. God gives the increase in his own time. Though it tarries, wait for it, right? And uh, and so like those two and a half uh, uh, tribes, they recognize their responsibility in their own day to the larger unity of Israel. And so may we recognize that uh, as well. That our walk with, it's not about God has a wonderful plan for my life. It's not, that's not the message. I know, I know we all heard that. That's, that's not the message. It's actually God has a wonderful plan for this world and we get to be a part of it. That's really the, the message. We get to be a part of what he is doing. And, you know, be encouraged because I, I believe very much that you know, we always like to say about Beth Messiah, it's a work born of God. And, you know, it really is. And every single one of us who just considers ourselves part of Beth Messiah is part of this work that God is doing this day. So let us remain faithful. Let us uh, recognize that, uh, you know, what's best for Beth Messiah, not just what's best for me, right? Just like those two and a half tribes, what's best for Israel was for them to fight, right, with their brethren. It wasn't just what's best for them, yet their preferences were validated. And so Beth Messiah is, is the sum of the whole, right? And, uh, and so very important that we recognize that all of us are validated. Uh, whether in the big picture, you know, we're, we're able to, uh, you know, do, do what each of us wants to do, but but recognizing, of course, that each of us is valuable. I think that's just the point I want to make, that everybody is valuable. Uh, you know, no one's just a cog in the wheel. Uh, you know, very, very important that everyone is valuable as we move forward in the work, you know, that God has called us to do. We are not called to be lone rangers, right? Uh, and, you know, that's kind of a danger of... Uh, you know, using the technology, Zoom, uh, YouTube, and so on. I know, I mean, I'm here today, right? But there's nothing like being together in person. There's something about, uh, there's something about that. Uh, because I, I know that, you know, you can watch the service like you're watching a television show and then turn it off, turn it on, and, and still be very isolated, yet, yet participating on a certain level. But when it is uh, good for everyone, I do hope that, you know, you will be, you will be um, uh, present and, uh, and do your best to, you know, be part of the whole even, you know, even now, right? You, you know, you're familiar, and we talk about it a lot, all those one and other passages. You know, it says in, uh, it says in uh, Romans chapter 12 that we are members of one of another, members of one of another, that we organically, you know, we belong to one another. We belong uh, to one another. And of course, you know, in the New Covenant, there's plenty of passages that talk about this. I'll just mention a couple of things. One is, you know, in Ephesians chapter 4, after Paul gets done, in the first three chapters, explaining how the, you know, the Gentiles are coming under the kingship of the God of Israel, or under the lordship of the king of Israel, I should say it that way. He then says at the beginning of chapter 4, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And then he says in the next couple of verses, how, not just what they should do, but how they should do. He says here, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another. That's a great little phrase. That means putting up with one another. <laughs> okay. Uh, in love being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, right? The unity is organic. The unity, when we come to know Messiah, we enter into a we enter into something that is unified. 
and that is into the very presence of God. All we can do is maintain it or destroy it, okay, by the way that we interact uh, with one another. And hopefully, as it says here, maintain the unity. Maintain the unity. Uh, and, uh, and so you have that, right? But then he also uh, uh, talks about individuals. If you go down to verse 11, it says, He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, uh, the holy ones, for the work of servants, to the building up of the body of Messiah, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of the Messiah. Uh, and, uh, and, and so when he says he gave some, meaning that he's given uh, individuals for the building up of uh, the, the body. And if you go all the, you know, farther down, it, it will talk about uh, here the proper working you know, uh, of uh, each individual, of, of each individual part. Uh, and uh, there in verse 16, the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up uh, of itself uh, in, in love. You know, and so very, very important that we recognize uh, you know, the individuality and importance of every person, and at the same time recognize the big, you know, the big calling to, uh, you know, to which we are called. And again, just, uh, you know, in Philippians, uh, you have uh, something somewhat similar. At the beginning of chapter 2, we read, If therefore there's any encouragement in Messiah, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any... Uh, affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. And he's saying, he's not asking the question, he's saying there is those things, <laughs> right? He's not saying, well, you know, if there is uh, uh, any encouragement in Messiah, yes, he's saying that rhetorically, yes, there is these things. Therefore, maintain uh, uh, that, uh, that unity. And then he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. And do not merely look out to your own, for your own personal interests, but also to the interests of others. And then he says, have the same attitude that you saw in Messiah Yeshua. And the, that attitude is, is that he became like one of us, and he died uh, an ignoble death. Uh, uh, for our sake, you know, he's saying, so in, that, in other words, Yeshua in his life uh, did not think of himself, but he thought of, of others to the point of death. And so, uh, you know, may we have that uh, a kind of attitude uh, and, um, and, and concern for one another. Uh, and um, just as we, uh, you know, as we uh, continue to move forward. And I know that, you know, we're, we are doing those things. And, you uh, this is just a word of, uh, of encouragement, really, to keep it up, <laughs> you know. Let's keep it up and um, keep moving forward together. Like I said, you know, whenever I uh, uh, travel, uh, it's, um, you know, it's always great to come back because there's no better place to be than, you know, at, uh, at Beth Messiah. But uh, may we guard that unity. You know, may we not just, may we never take anything for granted. So may we guard our unity. May we defer to one another. May we listen to one another, right? May we listen to uh, one another. May we be like Yeshua, right? Uh, and may we continue uh, the great work, you know, that we're doing. And may we, may we live this way. May we continue to make disciples and be a testimony of the risen Messiah of Israel. Let us endure, let us persevere, let us always keep our eyes on Yeshua, let us keep our eyes on the prize. And um, may God, uh, you know, uh, bless us, uh, protect us, guide us as we continue to yield indeed to him. And live in such a way that the world can see Yeshua in our midst. So let's pray and... Uh, 
and we'll be uh, we'll be set, and then I will turn it back uh, over to uh, Marcy. Uh, Lord uh, God, thank you, God, for the great for the work that you've raised up here in Columbus, Beth Messiah Congregation. Thank you that we get to be a part of it. Thank you that we all get get to be a part of it, and that we all get to be part of one another, uh, and have long, deep relationships uh, with each other, uh, and be a testimony to our community. May we continue to make disciples. May we continue to bring the good news of Messiah to our people. Lord, uh, may we continue to be built up in you, uh, Lord, and may we uh, be good stewards of the time in which you have given us to live here. Lord, teach us to number our days so that we may present to you a heart of wisdom and bless, indeed, the work of our hands. Pray in Yeshua's name. Amen.